Stand as we read the word of the Lord. Stand as we read the word of the Lord. First Samuel chapter 15. First Samuel chapter 15. I'm excited. I believe the Lord has some significant things to say to us. We're going to stand as we read the word. This is not just some uh, religious tradition, but it's our acknowledgement that the word of the Lord is above everything else. And so we are honoring him. Uh, even if you are watching online around the world, if you have the opportunity, you have the ability to stand, I would stand to honor the Lord. Again, this is not for us to see. This is you saying to the Lord, uh, you mean more to me. and Your word means more to me than anything else. First Samuel chapter 15, starting with verse 12, it's picking up in the middle of a narrative. I'm reading in the NLT. It says this, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I've carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle, I hear, Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted. But they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me and brought back the king, Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. You're like, oh, that's heavy for you to be reading and stopping right there. I want to pick up verse 22 just one more time. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission better than offering the fat of rams. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have a word for us. Lord, I pray that our ears would be open to hear and our hearts and our spirit would be open to hear what it is that you have to say to us. Father, I pray that by the power of your spirit, you would allow this moment to be a transformative moment because of the declaration of the power and the truth of your word. Father, may it do something in us. May our hearts be open. May our hearts be good ground. May the seed not be choked out, but Father, may it produce a harvest in us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you take these words of mine, translate them to the ears of every hearer to hear exactly what it is that you desire and intend for them to hear. And may we all be changed because of the declaration of your word. I also pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer and because of your goodness, mercy, and grace, you would reveal Jesus to those who have yet to come to the saving knowledge of Christ and save people. Uh, both in this room, on Online, presently and those who will watch in the future I pray in Jesus name amen you can be seated you can be seated I uh, want to make sure um, if the Lord gives me the grace and uh, ability that we uh, get through the majority of this I'm hoping that we will be able to but it's possible that we may not but we'll see what the Lord does um, 
As you know, uh, we did not have the opportunity to preach last week because the Lord preached his own message. Uh, and so we're so grateful and we will absolutely uh, yield the way uh, when he wants to preach his own message and, and speak uh, without uh, me having to be the one who's speaking. And so I'm so grateful for all that the Lord said and did. Uh, at the same time, I want to make sure uh, under the leading of the Lord that we have the opportunity to move forward uh, in our uh, narrative of what the Lord has us saying so that we have uh, contextualization and prophetic understanding as to what season we are in and what the Lord is inviting us into. And for uh, you who have the child, don't be too alarmed. It's okay. Um, we have our children with us, and I don't want you to feel uh, overly uh, sensitive about that. I have five children. I'm used to it. I can move through it. All right? <laughs> I know what happens. People are like, shh, shh, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. And it's like, okay, I, I, I get it. You know, sometimes they're just hungry, whatever, tired, fussy. It's all good. But just everybody in, in this room, we're all family. They're all of our kids. All right? Um, we've been talking um, uh, about the sovereignty of God and also obedience as well as weaving into this prophetically where we sense that we are uh, in this time in the earth. And so we've been doing that by using the, uh, a specific narrative uh, out of the book of 1 Samuel. And we're going to continue uh, to layer that. But one of the things that we understood that was necessary for us in order to fully embrace what the Lord is doing in this season is to also embrace the sovereignty of God. Uh, this part of his nature uh, and his character or the reality of who he is is very, very important if we're going to also have understanding about the season that we're in. Uh, and so we were saying things about the sovereignty of God and God being sovereign and because of his providence, he is involved in every detail of our lives. Anybody remember that? We've been talking about that all month. He's involved in every detail of our lives. This keeps us, if you remember this term, from living like functional atheists. Functional atheists would be those uh, who, who believe that God exists but live as if he doesn't. Uh, the sovereignty of God understanding this uh, allows us to do that. And one of the main reasons why we felt that it's been important for us to establish the sovereignty of God is to establish also that nothing happens on its own and nothing happens by chance. We saw that in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9 and verse 33. You don't have to put it up on the screen. Uh, we went over those scriptures before, but nothing uh, happens outside of the realm of God's control. And so nothing happens on its own. Nothing happens by chance. If you remember also, uh, we said that Charles Spurgeon uh, said it this way. Um, when you go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which you lay your head. We are able to rest because we know he's sovereign. I'm going to say it again. We are able to rest because we know he's sovereign. Uh, again, since we're, we're, it's out there in the open now, the reason why my, my, why my wife and I are able to sleep at night and able to sleep last night in the face of difficult news is because of the sovereignty of God. Because we are able to rest in the fact that he is God and nothing happens outside of his control. Amen. So, so Spurgeon went on to say this, there is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them and that sovereignty will sanctify them. There is nothing for which the children ought more earnestly to contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation. He goes on to make this statement, opposition to divine sovereignty is essentially atheism. Again, functional atheism, which, which fills churches, is believing that God exists while living as if he doesn't. And I made this statement to us, and it's vitally important that we also remember it is trusting in the sovereignty of God that makes everything that doesn't make sense make sense. It's, it's my, my inner knowing. It is the reality of what I know, and that is that no matter what season I'm in, God is in charge. <laughs> 
It is the sovereignty of God that causes what Paul wrote in Romans 8 to be both comforting and powerful when he wrote these words that we all know very well and we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who, are, for those who love God and are the call according to his purpose for them. This is what makes it powerful is the sovereignty of God. And we know, as we said two weeks ago, this statement is the bedrock foundation of our faith. We aren't wondering. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. We aren't questioning. We know. We aren't doubting. We know. We aren't pondering. We know. Somebody say it like you mean it. Say we know. God causes all things. Somebody say all things. He causes all things to work together for good. In other words, nothing surprises God. Nothing catches him off guard. He doesn't miss anything. He doesn't ignore anything. He uses all things. He has no contingencies. He has no plan B. Why? Because he knows all things. He uses all things and he knows all things. He uses all things and he knows all things. This is the divine foreknowledge of God. This is the providence of God. This is the sovereignty of God. And us seeing him in this manner will not only change the way we walk through life, it'll change our thoughts and it will change our worship. Unfortunately, family, we we have accepted to our detriment a lower view of God. We cannot accept a lower view of God or it changes your worship. Now you hold your worship hostage based on your circumstance. So if you're doing good, you give him worship. But if you're not doing good, you withhold it because somehow or another, you actually think he needs it. If he needs, listen, if you just read Revelation for a moment, you'll recognize that worship surrounds him. Worship is an invitation for you. I don't want to get ahead of myself. (laughs) Because we know, because this is a, the bedrock foundation of our faith, that's why the believer, this is just review for a moment, should never live in despair. Despair meaning no hope. Despair says that you have forgotten the sovereignty of God. Instead of we know, it's we wonder, we question if all things work together for good. Um, as the often quoted verse in Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 that people quote, they put on mud and quilts and every other thing they can find um, to put it on. Um, what, what we know is that God knows ahead of time his plan, even if we don't understand it, and his purpose is to give us hope. For those who might be in the room who don't know the verse I'm talking about, it's Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, they are plans for good and not disaster to give you a hope in the future. And you're like, oh, yeah, I saw that at my grandmother's house on a mug. <laughs> It's powerful. I'm not making light of it. I'm just, yes, okay. We, we understand it, that it is the sovereignty of God, the divine providence of God that makes that verse powerful. It's that even though people were entering into a 70-year captivity, he was saying, I know the end before you enter it. So no matter what you're going into, he's, he knows the end before you enter it. As Romans 5 tells us, even our suffering is to give us hope so that it won't disappoint. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Um, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And what do we know about the end of hope? That hope will not disappoint. God is involved in every detail, but he's also involved in every season and in every moment, no matter what season you find yourself in, which if I'm standing here speaking literally to to thousands of people at one time, both in this room and online, uh, what I also recognize is that I can't possibly know the myriad of different experiences or seasons personally that everyone finds himself in, but what I can tell you is I preach the sovereignty of God and exalt his nature is that no matter what season you're in, he's in it too. 
no matter what season you're in, he's orchestrating it too. There are people in this room who the news that they've received is worse than anything that we have received in the past few days. There are other people in this room that you just received the best news of your life and you are entering into the best season of your life and the best days of your life and things are looking up and things are looking amazing and you rejoice in that. But what Romans tells us and what Paul tells us in Romans is whether you find yourself in that kind of season or whether you find yourself in a season of suffering, God is using it all, which means that everybody in this room is right where God intends you to be. If we don't lean into the sovereignty of God, then we may be tempted to define seasons apart from him and his control, especially when we are in seasons that we don't like and can't control. Plainly put, some believers are quick to anoint seasons of difficulty, unexpected seasons, seasons of pain, and seasons of challenge as an attack from the enemy. Now, I want to help us with this as it relates to the sovereignty of God. Because particularly uh, those of us in a Pentecostal or charismatic uh, persuasion, um, everything that we don't like, everything that we don't understand, we quickly say it's the devil. I want to help us all. I want to help us all. Um, and be, because this is very, very important. We, we have some cultures that literally are just warfare all the time. And I'm like, you can't live there. Can I just help you? Can I? I love you deeper. You can't live in warfare all the time. At some point, you have to recognize that warfare has already been accomplished. And the one you are opposing has already been defeated. There are some times where you enter into certain conflicts, you're going to have to understand when it's time to go after it and when it's time to rest. Some of you are going to fall into some really difficult times if you try to war when you're supposed to be resting. To everything, there is a season. You, okay. So, the understanding of the sovereignty of God changes your perspective even about the enemy and attacks. We have a tendency, as I said before, that whenever we enter into seasons that we can't define, we define them or are quick to anoint them or define them as seasons of attack. And, and we hear so often from so many, uh, even over the past couple of years, that this season is an attack against the church and an attack against this and an attack against that. Let me help us. It very well may be, but it's not apart from the sovereign will of God. Can I say it again? Even if you agree that this season is a season of attack, even if that is your bent or even if that is your focus, there is another reality. And that focus is that even if it is an attack, it is not apart from the sovereign will of God. Are you hearing me? God, who is sovereign over creation, human history, and redemption, is always in charge. Can I say it again? God, who is sovereign over creation, human history, and redemption, is always in charge. We must be delivered from the mindset that we are living in a present battle between equal and opposite forces of God versus evil. Notice I didn't say good versus evil. I, I was specific in what I said. We must be delivered from the mindset that we are living in a present battle between equal and opposite forces of God versus evil. They are not equal. That's Hollywood, not Bible. Are you here in this room? They are not equal. John 1 says this, in the beginning the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness can never extinguish it or the darkness 
darkness cannot overcome it. Family, light, which is Jesus in this case, uh, and his word expels darkness, and darkness has no say, and darkness has no choice. Are you hearing me? God, who is good, God and evil are not equal and opposite forces in the universe. That is not what is happening. It takes a biblical understanding of sovereignty to admit, embrace, and be at peace with this reality. Evil does exist but it has already been defeated in eternity and has been appointed, to, has an appointed time for its ultimate end. God is not struggling with it. He's not striving with it. He allows it to accomplish his purpose. I understand because that's one of the things that trips you up in apologetics. Well, how come evil exists? Well, sovereign God allows it and uses it to accomplish his purpose. I understand. How come this is happening? How come that is happening? We may not understand everything, but what we can do is trust that our sovereign God is in charge. He allows it and uses it to accomplish his purposes. As we mature in the faith, we no longer see it like children who understand things through the lens of superheroes who strive with it and fight against it and ultimately prevail. We must must not project that the battle we have against the flesh we must not project that onto God as if he's also in that battle he delivered us from it I need you to hear me again what we have done to our detriment is we have projected onto God that the battle that we have against the flesh is also his battle no he's not fighting right now he's seated he is seated upon the throne. Let it talk to me, John the Revelator. I saw a throne in heaven and someone seated upon the throne. He's not at war. He's not in a battle. There's not a battle yet to come that he has to gear up for. The outcome is not in doubt. The end is not in doubt. The end is already settled. God is not in a battle with the devil. I want to say it again. This is one of the reasons why I even am careful. I, it, just in my own languaging. I don't say when preaching or I try to catch myself and not refer to any person in the Bible as a character. Sometimes we'll say things like, this is my favorite Bible character. It is not a superhero story. These are real people who trusted God. This is a real God who moved on behalf of a real people that is historically verified. They are not characters. They are people, which is why the scripture takes such time to tell us that Elisha was a man as we are, but yet when he prayed that it would not run. Are you hearing me? Because if you look at them as characters, then what happens is you start to think that the people in the Bible are like Superman and like Spider-Man and like Batman. That's how children understand it. God's going to kill the devil. He's going to destroy. No, 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 no. What we need to understand as we mature in the faith is that there is no contention that is happening right now. I understand what we see in this level. I understand what we deal with in this level. But if we would elevate our thought, if we would get a biblical idea, idea of who our God is that you would not think to yourself for one moment that the outcome is in doubt our God is not striving or fighting with the devil if you understood that about the sovereignty of God it would change the way you pray it would change your understanding because then you wouldn't be praying as if the outcome is in doubt. You would be saying your kingdom come, your will be done as it already is. I'm telling you, a people who will understand this, your intercession will change. A people who will understand this, you won't be striving and spitting and slobbering and sweating over stuff that is already done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In December, I believe it was, Pastor Matt, when he was preaching, 
he, he made this comment, and I just absolutely loved it. Um, I just said that God is not in a battle with the devil the way that Pastor Matt put it. Is he said the devil is not sitting across from the board playing God in chess. He's a piece on the board. They're not sitting here strategizing against each other. No, no, no. He's a piece on the board. Let me give you another definition. The devil is a dog on a leash. See, the reason why some of y'all didn't jump up right there is because you're still scared of the adversary. You're still scared about what can happen. But what I need you to understand through scripture is he's a dog on a leash. He's not running like he wants to. No, no, no. God controls what he can do. He can only do what he's allowed to do within the will of God who is the master of the universe and is sovereign which means that God does whatever pleases him. The devil is not allowed to do whatever he wants to you. He's only allowed to do what God lets him do so that God can ultimately get the glory out of it. That's why so many people struggle in warfare because they think somehow or another they're fighting. No, no, no. You're not fighting. You're revealing the glory of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, well, you sound awful confident. Where are you getting this from? Talk to me, Job. Talk to me, Job. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 1. This is Bible here. There once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. This is going to help some of you because some of you have grown up in a persuasion that if you're good, the devil will leave you alone. I just set some people free right there. You feel like if I don't talk about him, he won't come. If I live a certain way, he won't come. Uh, Job was blameless. He feared God and everything else. But look what happens. He had seven sons and three daughters. I know you know it, but let me read it. He owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 teams of oxen, and 500 female donkeys. He also had many servants. He was, in fact, the richest person in that entire area. Job's sons would take turns preparing feasts in their homes, and they would also invite their three sisters to celebrate with them. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days... Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. For Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Somebody said, that's a good dad. That's a good dad. He said, if my kids have messed up, God accept the sacrifice for them. That's a good dad right there. <laughs> This was his regular practice. One day, the members of the heavenly court came to present themselves to, before the Lord, and the accuser, Satan, came with them. Where have you come from, the Lord asked Satan. Satan answered the Lord, I've been patrolling the earth, watching everything that's going on. Then the Lord asked Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? He's the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Satan replied to the Lord, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home and his property which is to say that I can't get to him <laughs> his assertion was the reason why Job serves you is because you protect him and I can't touch him hallelujah hallelujah Sometimes you got to pray for the hedge. Sometimes you got to thank God for the hedge. I know that that's an a, 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 a aggregate, a Gregorian term for us, but, but anybody who's ever had a, a hedge of bushes around them or anything like that, it's a protection. But look at this. <laughs> you have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. All right. You may test him, the Lord said to Satan. Do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. He's a dog on a leash. Okay. You want to test him? You can test him, but I'm going to tell you how far you can test him. You want to touch him? You can do that, but I'm going to tell you what you can touch, but you can't touch him. 
Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Because some of us, we look at seasons. This is why it's so important. Listen to me, people. This is why it's so important that you don't anoint a season as something the devil is doing as if he has more power than God. This is one of the reasons why I struggle with everyone who is saying that this season is not of God. Because if you say it's not of God, you're saying it's outside of the control of God. It's outside of the realm in which God is in charge. And perhaps if you would see the sovereignty of God again, you might ask God, what is it that you are doing? Because if the whole body of Christ is rebuking the devil and it's not moving, perhaps he hasn't pulled him back yet. Uh oh. <laughs> He's a dog on a leash. Talk to me, book of John. Now, Jesus, John chapter 13, was deeply troubled and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table. Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, Who is he talking about? So the disciple, that disciple, leaned over to Jesus and said, Lord, who is it? Jesus responded, it is the one whom I give the bread, who I, whom, let me read it right. It is the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. See, I understand that some of you, you look at Judas as if the whole time he was a betrayer. Now he was, by, by divine foreknowledge, God knew that he was going to be the one to do it. But it was actually Satan that did the work. Because he is a dog on a leash. Judas didn't do what he did until Satan entered him. And when Satan entered him, Jesus spoke not to Judas. I need y'all to hear that. He wasn't talking. Then he said, do what you're going to do quickly. Why? Because you're nothing but a dog on a leash. You can only do what I give you the permission to do. And I'm telling you what you came to do, you better do it quickly. Don't waste my time here on earth. Don't be messing around now that you're in Judas doing a whole bunch of other stuff. Do what you're supposed to do and do it. <laughs> How do you know? Because the Bible says none of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. What, what do you mean Judas look, look at what it says it says since Judas was a treasurer some thought Jesus was telling him to go pay for the food <laughs> or give some money to the poor so Judas left at once going into the night in other words the disciples didn't even know Satan had entered him they didn't even know Jesus was talking to Satan not Judas <laughs> cause he's a dog on a leash talk about authority you want to talk about authority? He's sitting at the table knowing what's about to happen. Satan enters in. No one else knows that he looks at Satan and says, you got a short amount of time. That's authority. When you know you have authority. <laughs> let, let, oh, my goodness. Uh, this excites me. I'm sorry. How do we know Jesus had authority? Look at John chapter 13, verse 2 and 3 real quick. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas. He hadn't entered him yet. He had prompted him, gave him an idea. He had already prompted Judas, the son of Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him what? Authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return from God. So Jesus knew that he had all authority. And so at that moment, this is how he's talking. That's straight authority. Look at Matthew chapter 8 real quick. Let me just, I'm going to layer this one more time because I think some of us need to hear it. Because if anything, some of you are going to leave here no longer afraid of the devil. Mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that he can't do anything but it does mean that whatever he does is controlled you understand there are certain things that we want to have to resist there are certain things that we're going to have to rebuke I totally get it but understand this he's not allowed to just run roughshod over the believer 
you're going to stop cowering in your house as if you have no control. You are a child of the sovereign God who is your father and determines. Have you ever been out walking and somebody who has a dog and the dog looks vicious and the dog starts growling and barking and running to you but the master yanks? Some of y'all running and you didn't know that the dog was on a leash. <laughs> Hallelujah. And just know this too. This ain't the fullness of my message. I got a major point to get to. But just know this. If the dog seems like he's going to break the leash, the dog is going to run into a lion. Ain't no dog in the world that can beat a male lion called the Lion of Judah. Keep messing with me if you want, but if you get too close to me, you're not fighting me. You are going to run into the Lion of Judah. Hallelujah. I wish somebody who knows that their God is the Lion of Judah would release a roar in this room. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 You know, my wife said, I want to come to church today because I want to worship God and I might dance all around this room. She did not come here saying, I want to cry. She did not come here saying, I don't have any hope. She did not come here saying, I don't know what's going to happen. She did not come here saying, I hope we don't get more bad news. What she said was, I understand. She didn't say it this way. Satan is a dog on a leash. I will not be afraid of this dog when I am a child of the king. I will praise him. It is the sovereignty of God that we rest on at night because we know who our God is. <laughs> somebody give him praise right here somebody give him praise right here somebody give him praise right here nothing happens in your life by chance nothing happens in your life that God is not control of give him praise hallelujah 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 can only do what he's allowed to do he hear this sometimes they mess with you demons and stuff like this because my son they are aware that they have a limited time you may not understand the times you may not understand the season that you're in, but every demon that roams the earth knows that it has a limited amount of time. Okay, Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, talk to us, Matthew chapter 8. When Jesus arrived on the other side of the lake in the region of the Garden, Gadarene, excuse me, two men who were possessed by demons met him. They came out of the tombs and were so violent that no one could go through that area. They began screaming at him, why are you interfering with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before God's appointed time? <laughs> they are fully aware that there is a time that is coming that is dedicated for our torture and our eradication and we only have a limited time and because you showed up we feel like you are interfering with our timeline <laughs> God 
is sovereign over everything. Let me say it again. God is sovereign over everything. How do we know? Because we as believers know. Don't We don't wonder. We don't question. We don't ponder. We know that he causes all things to work together for good. For those who love him and are they called according to his purpose. Why are we layering this so much? So that we don't define seasons in a way that causes us to resist God instead of ask God, God, what are you doing? There are so many people who enter seasons of their life and because they have defined it as the devil working, they have resisted what God is doing and in so doing, they are resisting God himself instead of asking him, God, what are you doing? That's why James 1 says it this way. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. What is the wisdom that you're asking for? What are you doing in my life in this season? If I'm going through this test, God give me wisdom. If you're going through this trial, God give me wisdom. If I'm going through suffering, God give me wisdom. And he will not rebuke you for asking, God, what are you doing? (laughs) The sovereign God who is providential in nature, divinely orchestrates seasons, times, and circumstances to accomplish his will and desires. Let me say it again. The sovereign God, who is providential in nature, divinely orchestrates seasons, times, and circumstances to accomplish his will and desires. In other words, family, he does things with the end in mind. God is not making it up as he goes, but rather directing things from the beginning with the end in mind. (laughs) That's why Isaiah chapter 46 verse 10 says this, only I can tell you the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass for I do whatever I wish. God, who predetermined to have a people adopted into his family who are chosen in him before the foundation of the world has given us the privilege of being included in what he's doing in the earth. What a privilege. What a privilege. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 and 5 even before he made the world we talked about this two weeks ago God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ this is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure now y'all remember this he chose us do y'all remember that He chose us in Christ to be pure and or to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Us is referring to the church, which is the called out company of those who are incorporated into Christ. Before the foundations of the world were laid, God had determined that all who believe on his son should be saved. He calls that a chosen people. So the us of scripture is the the predetermination of God to have a people. That is what we call predestined. He predestined to have a people so that everyone who believes in him, the saved people, the church, are the us who are also known as the chosen. (laughs) He predetermined to have a people. Who are the chosen? Us. All who have placed their faith in Christ. Do y'all remember this? Maybe some of you weren't here. The chosen is us. And who is us? All who have placed their faith in Christ. Which means, as I said before, one saved person can't look at another saved person and say, I'm chosen and you're not. 
All of us who have placed our faith in Christ are the chosen. This is important. The question that I posed the last time that I preached was this. What do the chosen do with the knowledge that they're chosen? It is clear from scripture that all of us are included in the plan of God. Can I say it again? It is clear from scripture. This is important, family. Lean in for just a moment. Somebody say, let's go deeper. It is clear from scripture that all of us are included in the plan of God. But what is also clear is that not all of us choose to be involved in the plan of God. It's a complex sentence. Let me say it again. It is clear from Scripture that all of us are included in the plan of God. But what is also clear is that not all of us choose to be involved in the plan of God. What then is the determining factor? Obedience. What is the determining factor? Obedience. Obedience to God and his word or the other choice disobedience. The determining factor that separates the us is not the fact that we're chosen. All of us are chosen. The determining factor then that actually separates your involvement or determines your level of involvement or the part you play or if you've chosen him is obedience or disobedience. This is where it gets quiet. But this is what moves us out of the fallacy of assumption into action. Can I say it again? This is what moves us out of the fallacy of assumption into action. Because we are saved, we who are saved are chosen, it means that inclusion in the plan of God is available to everyone. Can I say it again? We got we to gotta, we gotta do some digging here. Because we who are saved are chosen, it means that inclusion in the plan of God is available to everyone. Meaning the intent of God for us is already defined based on the fact that we're saved. The fact that we are saved, the scripture then lays out God's divine intent for us. You don't really have to pray or wonder about purpose. The intent of God for all who are saved is already laid out in scripture. He has a divine intent for everyone. (laughs) The issue, the issue is that too many assume inevitability. And then, as a result, coast through this life of faith as if their decisions don't have any bearing on their life. (laughs) Prophetically, we can sense preparation for a coming emergence. That which seemingly comes out of nowhere. A people out of the sight of man, but in the heart and the mind of God. I talked to us for a moment. I've been layering all of this so that we could have some prophetic insight. Let me say it again. Prophetically, as we look into the lens of the future by God's grace, what we can sense is a preparation happening right now for a coming emergence. That which is seemingly comes out of nowhere in a people out of the sight of man, but in the heart of God. So to define what we're going through, the turbulence that we're going through in the earth right now is because, hear me, of the overlapping of two seasons. Can I define it for you? The turbulence that we are sensing right now is because of the overlapping of two seasons. What are we talking about? The end of one and the beginning of another. One hidden from the natural eye while the other is still happening. An overlap. Let me define it for you. And somebody say overlap. If you want to understand a moment of time we're in right now, prophetically, it is an overlap. Y'all quiet. It's all good. What is an overlap? It is occupying the same area at the same time. 
and overlap is occupying the same area at the same time to extend over or pass, thus covering part of something. So what we are looking at right now is two cycles of time and two seasons momentarily occupying the same space of time. One cycle is obvious and the other is hidden. When something is overlapping, it is covering one thing. So one thing is obvious and the other is hidden. What do we have going on right now in the realm of the spirit and overlap? Two cycles of time occupying the same time. I'm going to go a little bit further. Somebody say, let's go deeper. As the new overtakes the old there will be an emergence of what was once hidden. The moment that this generation was crying out for is on its way. It is happening while hidden. Can I say it again? It is happening while also hidden. Now, why did I insert this right here? Because I want us to understand something. There will be an emergence of sons and daughters that will reveal the kingdom. <laughs> However, if you want to be or believe to be a part of the emerging company, this is a season that God has designed of preparation for that season. In the overlap. But the reason I have to say it this way, the reason I have to teach it this way, the reason why I don't just stand up and talk about what's coming and how it's coming and how we can rejoice and all that stuff is because everyone automatically assumes that when God talks about the emergent company, it's them. It could be you. Ooh. Yeah, I'm so glad we were shouting earlier. Because y'all are quiet as a church mouse now. <laughs> to automatically assume that it is you is the wrong assumption. This is why so many people have difficulty utilizing the Old Testament term remnant in the current age. They have a difficulty with it. Why? Because they understand what the scripture says about the us. They understand what the scripture says about the nature of the chosen, which is all who are saved. So then if the chosen are all who are saved, why in the world would you use an Old Testament terminology like the word remnant? Why? Because access is given to everyone who is saved. So remnant terminology is challenged if it simply means a special people who are set apart and more specifically was referring to a sub set of people with and among the children of Israel who stayed true while others strayed. So they look at that and they say this was talking about a subset of people among the children of Israel but now that the church age has been inaugurated that means everybody so why in the world are you talking about remnant especially if in the current age it's true that the chosen are all who are saved. We know this. Why? Because 1 Peter 2 9 says but you are a chosen race, talking about all those who are part of the saved company, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who, were, who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you'd receive mercy. And so they look at that and they say how in the world can you actually think about an emergent company or talk about or have have in your lips in this current age a word like remnant when it's all of us. In this age, remnant terminology metaphorically speaks not about who is chosen, but rather who among the chosen has chosen him. Can I say it again? Biblically, it is difficult to use the terminology in the new covenant. So now we are talking about a metaphor. <laughs> it is not 
saying that there's a special group among the saved. It's actually now referring to those who among the chosen have actually chosen him. Can I say it again? It is not saying that God has a special group among the chosen. That's why you can't look at somebody and say, he's talking about me. No, he's talking about us. But now what is us going to do with what we know? Are we going to do something about it or are we going to live in the fallacy of inevitability? Which just assumes that because the us has been spoken, that we have nothing to do. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You see, the assumption of inclusion is one of the catalysts of complacency. Why do believers get complacent? Because they feel like everything is going to come to them no matter what. Why would there ever need to be urgency in preaching if by osmosis and just sitting there as a believer you're just gonna get it (laughs) i understand that we live wholly to please god not to get something from god i understand that we live consecrated and sanctified lives because we want to be near god not because we want to get something from god but it says a whole lot if you are willing to stay in your immaturity because the spirit of god actually draws you to desire to grow and mature and so if you don't desire that, it begins to question the activity of the spirit in you and that leads you to a place of complacency. You got a few more minutes? I told you I got a game to watch. <laughs> Being chosen or saved, just so you understand, speaks of divine intention. Which means this family, hear me, everything you can possibly need has been stored up for you. If you are saved and chosen, hear these promises. Everything you could possibly need has been stored up for you. The invitation of participation has been extended to you. When you hear prophetic proclamations about times and seasons, God is talking about you, but it's not guaranteed to be you based on your response. This is the part nobody wants to talk about. This is the part that nobody wants to talk about. That's why we are placing our biblical focus on the moment of transition between Saul and David because there's something for us to learn here even in this age because this is also a moment of transition even if it's not recognized but to the natural eye. The transition family, hear me, as we go back through this story, you'll see it. The transition from Saul to David happened in the spirit long before it was made known to the natural eye. God chose David before Samuel did. Which means that transition to God happened in the spirit before it happened in the natural Are y'all here? Which means that if he did it that way before, it also indicates to us that things can transition in the realm of the spirit long before we see them. Can I say it again? In other words, you can't sit here comfortable right now because there is a transition that is happening in the realm of the spirit now. And it might take a whole decade for the rest of the world to catch up. But for those who are in the spirit, this is your time to prepare. This is your time to obey. I need you to understand, don't miss this time because if you look 10 years later and say I want in on it you might discover that disobedience has sealed your fate okay 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 today we can look back on that moment and see that decisions have connotations 
to this moment. <laughs> you look at your life in this moment right now, you are either Saul or David. You are either rebellious or obedient. <laughs> When words like an emerging company of people are given, everybody believes they're David. Everybody's like, yes, I'm David. Now, let me make it clear. <clears throat> David, in this case, is just a prophetic metaphor because David was a precursor of Christ. So when we talk about an emerging company, Christ and his kingdom is what the emerging company will reveal to this generation, which is why this season had to happen to separate the obedient from the rebellious and by the grace of God, give the rebellious the opportunity to become the obedient. Did you hear that? In other words, your fate isn't sealed yet. Are you hearing? God is separating the rebellious from the obedient, but by his grace, he's also giving the rebellious the opportunity to become. This is such an interesting season. In a way that we have not seen in our lifetime. We see it in biblical history, we see it in world history, we see it in church history, but we have not seen it this way in our lifetime. There is a separation that is happening right now. <laughs> and everybody is like, I'm David. Let me help us. Church attendance does not make you David. Checking the Christian box in the Christian nation does not guarantee your part in it. If we don't hear and embrace these things now, we will continue to live the way we have been when this is the time to prepare. <laughs> Interesting, I, I began this year saying there were some things I was sensing and seeing, and I know this. If I had just come out and said there'll be an emerging company of people who will be filled with power and authority, and who God will use to usher in the new season and cycle of time, the honest truth is that the assumption would be that it's everyone, and it's not. Amen. Hear the difference. It is for everyone. But not everyone receives it. What God is saying is for all of us. I am not talking about a subset of us in this room, nor am I talking about a subset of prophetic people, nor am I talking about a subset of the church, nor am I talking about any kind of denominational persuasion or any kind of theological persuasion and say, I'm not talking in code. The scripture is clear. When God is speaking, he is speaking to all of us. The challenge is that not all of us receive it. So you could be sitting next to someone who is chosen, David. It just so happened to be your name is David. <laughs> but someone is in this room saying, God, whatever you have to do. Someone sitting next to you in the same room, shouting, worshiping, praising God praying, but when God invites them in their private time to, to stop living how they're living, they don't do it. And as a result, they actually miss out because of the assumption of inclusion. I got to go faster. I got to go faster. Ephesians 1 makes it clear that there are chosen people who place their faith in Christ. Ephesians 2 and 3 make it clear that the intent of God is to use the church, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. So it is not a secret or select group, but rather an intentionally submitted and obedient group. It's available to everyone, but not everyone wants it. So we must avoid what I've preached to us 
once before what I call the assumption of inclusion. I'm not about to preach it now because that was its own message. But the interesting thing is, out of this particular message, we see a particular parable that Jesus uses to talk to a man who assumed his inclusion in the things of God. Let me, let me go because I discovered, I discovered that there are three types of people in the earth as it relates to the move of God. There are those who don't want it because they see Jesus as a disruptor. There are those who just assume that it will happen, but they do nothing about it. And there are those who are crying out for it by the way they live. Let me just help you. I had to add that marker right there because a lot of times we feel like we can just get in church and cry out for it and it's going to happen. But you can cry all you want to down front. But if your life doesn't change, you are not actually crying out for a move of God. Those who cry out for a move of God, their cry down here also affects how they live when they leave here. (laughs) The assumption of inclusion, complacency. Let me go quickly because I got some more good stuff than I'm hoping the Lord will let me get to. Hallelujah. Are you getting something? Luke, book of Luke, chapter 14. Let's go here real quick. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. When Jesus, starting with verse 7, noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them his advice. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has been invited? Then the host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all the other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Verse 15, hearing this, a man, I couldn't just start with verse 15, I had to give you context. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with this story. (laughs) He was like, oh, so you think you're going to be there, huh? A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. When the banquet was ready, he sent out his servant to tell the guests, come, the banquet is ready. But then they all began making excuses. One said, I've just bought a field and I must expect it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant, and basically said, I got to ask my wife. (laughs) the servant returned and told his master what they had said his master was furious and said go quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and invite the poor the crippled the blind and the lame after the servant had done this he reported there's still room for more so his master said go into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full for none of those I first invited will even get the smallest taste of my banquet this is what Jesus said to the man who said it's going to be great to be there I need you to think about this context. This man said, what a blessing it'll be to to sit at the banquet of the kingdom of God, assuming that he would be there. And Jesus said, basically, I need you to hear this. You were invited, but you weren't. There's plenty of people who are going to be invited, but they're going to make excuses as to why they can't come. Because what we understand is at that time, i got to go quickly here, what we understand at that time, uh, contextually, uh, number one, uh, people were invited to something, and then a second invitation was given to say, it's now ready. Right? So you, you had, I'm preparing something. That was the first invitation. The second invitation is to say it is now ready. Contextually, this scripture, I understand, deals with the illusion of the extension of the gospel to the Gentiles. So that's what this is dealing with. Um, but the second invitation, which is to say it's ready. Don't give excuses when God is saying that what I've been prepared is ready. Or finding things that are more important. So what happened was all these excuses meant that they were giving their life priority over the kingdom. 
They were all excuses that they made. The reality is that the second invitation that was given is an invitation to leave whatever it is that you are doing to attend the banquet of the kingdom which was spread before you. When we reject the second invitation, God's response is, go get those who will appreciate being in my presence. Yes, contextually, it's likely talking about the Gentiles. The pre-invited guest was Israel, who through the entirety of the Old Testament were told to be ready for the arrival of the Messiah. But some rejected him, making excuses. And as a result, those who were considered outsiders, us, are now invited. This is how Jesus responded to the man who assumed he would be there. Because... I'm a part of the children of Israel. I'm chosen. And so I'll be there and in the center of what God plans to do no matter how I live. That's essentially what the man was saying. I'm a Jew. So of course I'll be there. And Jesus is like, oh, really? Those who will be there are those who are willing to alter their life when they meet me. <laughs> are y'all getting that? This is important for us. So he's assuming that I'll just be there. But looking back at the story of Saul and David, metaphorically speaking, there is a system that had arisen that God was rejecting in Saul because it had an assumption. And so obedience Matters. Let me get back to my foundational scripture and I'll get us out of here. One day, 1 Samuel chapter 15, I'll start with verse 1 and I'll skip to verse 12. One day, Samuel said to Saul, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of his people Israel. Now listen to this message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle the accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Get rid of them. Skip down to verse 12. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. This is after things had happened. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. This is where we started today. Then he went on to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I've carried out the Lord's command. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear? Samuel demanded. Remember... Remember what we just read in verse 3. Go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Samuel shows up and Saul is like, I did what the Lord said. And Samuel is like, then why do I hear all these sheep and all these cattle and all these goats? So Saul says, it is true that the army spared the best of the sheep and goats and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. <laughs> we have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you, Saul asked. Then Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you go and completely destroy the sinners the Amalekites until they are all dead why haven't you obeyed the Lord why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight but I did obey the Lord Saul insisted I carried out the mission he gave me I brought back King Agag but I destroyed everyone else then my troops brought the best of the sheep goats and cattle and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal but Samuel replied what is more pleasing to the Lord your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice 
And submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, disobedience, he has rejected you as king. Somebody say this. Obedience Obedience. is better than sacrifice. I know that you know this. I know you can say this with your eyes closed. I know that when we read this scripture, uh, it is familiar to you, but say it out loud so that your spirit man can hear it. Obedience Obedience. is better than sacrifice. Look how Eugene Peterson puts these two verses in the message. Then Samuel said, do you think all God wants are sacrifices? Empty rituals just for show? He wants you to listen to him. Plain listening is a thing, not staging a lavish religious production. Not doing what God tells you is far worse than fooling around in the occult. Getting self-important around God is far worse than making deals with your dead ancestors. Because you said no to God's command, he says no to your kingship. Saul is saying, I thought that's what God wanted from me. Like many of us. Shouldn't he be pleased with me? I come to church every week. I thought that's what he wanted. Like, what, what are you talking about? This other stuff, like, I, I was, like everything I was doing, like, I, I know that I haven't been given and stuff, but like, one day I was going to give this really large gift to God. Oh, it got quiet. Like, don't you understand? Like, I'm down front every week. Like, I'm singing the songs that are on the screen. I know these songs. Like, I listen to Christian music sometimes. I mean, you know, like, I mean, my wife, we want to get together. We might not listen to that, but then it extends. But, you know, like, I'm pretty much got my mind on him from... A prayer call. We're laughing. But somehow or another, we think that God needs our worship sacrifice. Let me let you in on it. We needed the sacrifice. I don't have time to go into it, but the fact that Jesus came, Hebrews chapter 10, and is a sacrifice once and for all, he sacrificed his life for us because we needed it. God does not delight in sacrifices. Okay. Our religious activity is not what he's looking for. Oh, I know I wasn't going to get a bunch of shouting right there because this is where we come down the street. After they're finished singing, after you've sung with them, that was not the end. That was not the part that God was looking for. There must be some decisions that we make that place God in his proper perspective. I will give you a simple example from my own life. Just a simple example. This is not comprehensive. It's just a simple example. I made a determination in my heart yesterday as my wife and I were receiving bad news upon bad news to make sure that I went to God before I went to my friends. Now, I need you to hear me. It was to say that in order for me to put you, God, in your proper place, to say to you that you are in your proper place before I text my friends and say pray, I actually pray first. Before I share my burden with others, I cast it. (laughs) 
I hope y'all hearing it. Okay. I'm, I'm, I have some really, really amazing scriptures and points, but for the sake of time, we're not going to go all the way there. But the scripture is very clear to us. You can write this down. Psalm chapter 40, verse 6 through 8, that God does not delight in sacrifices or offering. You can write it down. Psalm chapter 40, verse 6 through 8. The words of Saul's successor in Psalm 51, 16 and 17. Again, David saying, you do not desire a sacrifice or else I would give it. What a revelation because he lived in the age where sacrifices were required. Are you hearing it? He lived in the age in which sacrifices were required, but he came to the revelation that you don't actually want that. You want my heart. That, that my repentance before you is not that I'm down front demonstratively looking like I got it together. It's that my heart is broken before you in such a way that my obedience is what makes my sacrifice powerful. My sacrifice without my obedience makes it nothing. <laughs> Are y'all hearing? Okay. Our worship apart from our obedience is not worship. As someone, DGF, they didn't clap for me, so. As someone who God has favored to lead worship around the world, my concern about this generation of worship proliferation is that a bunch of people think that because they're singing, they're right. We can fill stadiums of disobedient singers. What makes worship powerful? What makes a sacrifice powerful? What makes it powerful? Obedient life. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. But you would think that since I'm camping right here, that this would be the end of the point. But somebody come play. I told you I was done. <laughs> you know, the music signifies that we're ending. <laughs> I should say David come play, because if somebody came to play, that would be a problem. All right? <laughs> you can start playing like, yeah. Um, Disobedience. What Saul did? Disobedience. In 1 Samuel 13, he refused to wait, which is to signify that there are people who get ahead of God's timing. And because he refused to wait, God was dealing with him about that. And then in 1 Samuel 15, he disobeyed the command of the Lord, which actually revealed the disposition of his heart posture towards God, which is to say, I don't have to listen to you. Rebelled against the timing of God in 1 Samuel 13. Rebelled against the voice or the instruction of God in 1 Samuel 15. I'm summarizing now. But I want you to hear the issue of what Saul was actually guilty of. Can I show you this really fast and I'll finish? Somebody say yes. Okay. <laughs> Y'all was like, not another. Look at this. I'm going to read it again. But Samuel replied, because in Luke chapter 14, the man was guilty of assumption. 1 Samuel chapter 15, there was another guilt here. 1 Samuel chapter 15, 22, 23, I'm going to read it one more time. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission better than offering the fact of 
rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. The New Living Translation right there, which I read, reads this word, stubbornness. The Amplified reads it this way, disobedience. The Christian Standard Bible reads it this way, defiance. The ESV translates this word very well. It says presumption. Saul was guilty of presumption. Family, I need you to hear this. I know I'm at the end, but I need you to hear the power of this. Saul was guilty of presumption. What is presumption? It is the arrogance of assumption. That's why I read Luke chapter 14 to you. Because there are a number of people who right now are hearing prophetically what the Lord is proclaiming, but you are saw and you don't know it because you are guilty of presumption, which is the arrogance of assumption. What was Saul's assumption? Saul assumed that his choosing secured his place. Who are we? The chosen. The sin of presumption does this. No matter what I do, no matter how I live, I assume my place. That is the sin of presumption. And the challenge is this. God sees it as idolatry. For an entire year, the Lord said to this house and to the nation of the earth, for those who are watching, repent and turn from your idolatry. And now he says, I have an emerging company in an overlapping season. Something that I'm doing in the background that people can't see. A people that will seemingly come from nowhere. An obedient people I have chosen. And I say to you that if you want to be a part of that company, you must not fall into the sin of Saul, which is the sin of presumption. Which is to say, I hear all this, Pastor. I hear what you're preaching over the last month. The sovereignty of God, I got that. Emerging company, I got that. Yep. Davids are coming. I got that. He's working in the background. I got that. And the whole time, God's also saying during a season of consecration, oh, yes, but would you also make sure that you're obedient? Would you also make sure that you don't miss what it is that I am doing because of your obstinance, your stubbornness, your disobedience, your defiance, your presumption that you don't have to change anything in order to be included in the plan of God? Don't make the mistake or you will find yourself looking oh it got really quiet Pastor Jerry let me define obedience and give the mic up what does God look for among the chosen submission and obedience A succinct definition of biblical obedience is this. Write it down. Put it on your phone. Obedience. To hear God's word and act accordingly. Let's demystify it. Obedience. To hear God's word and act accordingly. Obedience. To hear God's word and act accordingly. 
can't give you the context of this, but I want you to throw up one verse of scripture as I sit down. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse 46. Let this sit on you. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Would you close your eyes now and lift your hands to the Lord? Yes, we don't shout at the end of this one. We allow the Holy Spirit to do his work in us. We don't want to be a people who miss it. What are we going to do with our choosing? This word is for everybody. It is for everybody. Not just the special people among us. You are the special people. What God is looking for is that you don't live such a presumptuous life that you are unwilling to change, unwilling to be obedient, unwilling to allow him to change you. He does not delight in sacrifices. He does not delight in the external show that we give him. He delights in obedience. He delights in obedience. And so, Father, I pray and as our hands are lifted to you and our posture is before you, that among this people you will find a people who you can use significantly because they have chosen you. Let there be in this room and those who are watching online among the chosen, those who have also chosen you. Those who recognize who you are, those who recognize that you have divinely orchestrated this season in order to test the hearts of your people, in order to reveal the hearts and the motivations of your people. And out of this season, let there emerge a company of people who will reveal Jesus because they have chosen you and not been disobedient to your word. Let that be our heart, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.